Need a holiday gift that will keep her sparkling all year long? Right now, Blue Nile, the original online jeweler, is offering 30% off select jewelry. With experts on hand 24-7 to provide guidance, you're sure to find the perfect piece. And now, there's even more to love about shopping at BlueNile.com. For a limited time, get 36-month special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. In sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 drive to survive, untold, and many more now on Netflix. Serie Chronicles is a Media Chronicles production. Hey, and welcome to our highlights reel for 2021, showcasing some of our favorite moments from podcast since we started in September. Gosh, how the months have flown, guys. I can't believe we've already rattled through half a Serie season. Um, since we launched Serie Chronicles in September, we've had some wonderful guests on the show. Our first guest was the legendary Socceroos, Manchester United, Chelsea and Aston Villa goalkeeper Mark Bosnich. And one of my favourite bits of our podcast with Mark was when I got to ask him quite how close he came to playing in Serie A. Dublin's inside the penalty area. This is Salt Betts. Somehow kept out by the legs of Bosnich. Villa trying to break, but Salt Bet denied by an acrobatic stop from Mark Bosnich in the Villa goal. It was like something you'd see in the circus Big Top. And probably the sort of save that only the elastic Bosnich could produce. Mark, I want to, while we've got you, quickly ask you, because we had mentioned the top about how you had this uh, brilliant playing career. You played um, Aston Villa, Manchester United, obviously for the Socceroos. Was there ever a moment when you could have gone to Serie A? Was there ever a moment when that could have happened? Yes, there, yes, there was. And, um, and I'm... And, uh... Now knowing that Mina's such a uh, Juventus fan, she's going to go uh, crazy at me for this one. But I, I had unfinished business at Manchester United. I was at Manchester United as a young kid and I couldn't stay in the country because I couldn't get a work permit. But mm. that, that sorted itself out. And I wanted to go back there and win something, which I did. But during that season, so that was 1998-99, first and foremost, Roma were very interested. Um, Capello was going to be their new manager. Uh, he'd known me from uh, a game that we played with the Socceroos way back when I was young against AC Milan here in Sydney. So um, I was very, very close. But basically, during that time, Manchester United had made their intentions clear. And I had to, I had to tell basically Rome, I said, look, listen, I'm, I'm most probably going to go back to my old club. However, if you remember that season, uh, Manchester United played Juventus in the semifinals of the Champions League. And remember, the first leg was 1-1. I think Antonio Conte scored in that first leg, um, actually against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Well, the second leg, um, Juventus went up, as you remember, 2-0 and then ended up losing 3-2. Um, but during the game, I was actually flying flying to Turin to speak to Juventus. And I remember before I got onto the plane, thinking <sighs> to myself, okay, I thought, I thought to myself, and I should have stuck with this. I should have thought the game was on. I thought, right. Whoever loses the game, I reckon I'm going to go to because they'll have something to do next season, yeah? Uh, fully expecting that Manchester United were going to lose. Yeah, but that told me a story in itself. And as I was getting on my plane, my agent at the time rang me and said, Juventus are winning 2-0. So I was like, okay, fair enough. 
Anyway, we get off the plane at the end of the game uh, and Juventus had sent somebody <laughs> to pick me, up, pick me up from the airport. And lovely man, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. And, uh, and I remember saying to him, you know, because he could speak English, which was great because my Italian wasn't, wasn't particularly crash hot. I remember saying to him, who won? What was the score? And he started saying, as he's wheeling out my luggage from the airport, he started saying, it was a beautiful game. It was this. And I was like, what was the score? He said, Manchester United come back and won 3-2. So I was like, okay, okay, fair enough. So anyway, the, the following day I met with, uh, oh, no. with Betiga, uh, Moji, Geraldo, and who was going to be their new manager, uh, Carlo Ancelotti. And they were very good. They were very nice. and They, they, they made it very clear that they, they wanted me to sign. Um, obviously had my agent there. I also had the interpreter as well. And I just said, look, can I just have the weekend to think about it? Um, so I had the weekend to think about it and I, and my, I, I made up my mind. I felt terrible because I, you know, in hindsight, I should have went, I really should have went because I think it, even from a personal point of view playing, uh, in Italy, I think it would have been really good, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, just living in Italy, uh, for a good amount of time and the way that they go about things in football, I think it would have been, it would probably would have been a, a better bet. But in the end, I went to see Sir Alex on that Sunday. And I told him exactly what happened, and um, and like obviously he was, I don't know if he believed me or whatever. Because he, I remember he was saying, "Who was there?" You know, I, said, um, I made my mind up to go to Manchester United, but that was yeah. I, I probably should have, you know, with hindsight, I think it would have been better for the longevity of my career to go to Italy at that stage. We would have loved to have you. I can't believe that. Who says no to Juventus? But it is Alex Ferguson. So I understand that. I would have found it difficult as well. <laughs> it's it's so funny because well, because you ended up at Manchester United, obviously you were filling the shoes of Peter Schmeichel, one of the, yeah. the great goalkeepers of all time. Um, if you'd gone to Juventus, you could have been the predecessor to Gigi Buffon. You would have been there just before <laughs> he came in. So timing. Well, exactly right. Well, as somebody told me the other day, it, they said, um, I won't say who because you guys will know who it is. I'll keep his his name. But somebody told me the other day. He said, you know, if you went to if you know if you went to Juventus, he said, um, you know, Ancelotti then because you know he said he really liked you would have taken you then to AC Milan. You would have won two European cups. I was like, thanks for telling me. I really appreciate that. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. You did end up with a lot of Italians in Chelsea, uh, Chelsea in West London. So you sort of had a half Italian experience. Yeah, yeah, very much. So. Chelsea is sort of the, the London, Italy. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, little, little Italy in London. You're 100 percent right, and uh, that that was it. There was obviously Gianfranco Zola was there, Claudio or Mister, as we used to call him, uh, and his staff. That that was, it was a really good experience working with them. Yeah, and uh, the, the goalkeeper coach was the best goalkeeping coach that I had in all my time uh, playing uh, in the UK, Giorgio Pellizzaro. I don't know if he's still alive, but he was, he was not only a great character, but he was a superb coach. And, uh, and uh, it was a learning experience. I, I think I, I felt really sorry for, uh, uh, Mr., uh, well, for, uh, for Claudio because English, what, you know, his English then wasn't as good as it is now. And I think that's so important that a coach you know, needs to communicate with his players. And you've got to also remember as well, although Chelsea was pretty much a foreign team, there were still a core players of English players and some of these ways and way of doing things was, even though they're now you know, familiar with everyone, it was still cha help changing the culture. You know, people had seen what Arsene Wenger had done at the Arsenal and, uh, and, and, and it was just sort of, you know, still trying to change that type of culture. But I saw the makings that I remember before he went to Leicester and had that amazing title win and somebody actually asked me on radio, you know, how do you think you do? And I thought there was just the right timing then uh, because you could see the makings of it back then. And uh, obviously, the more and more he'd become familiar with the league, the more and more comfortable he would be and the more foreign players that came in. And let's not forget as well, like I said, for me, the Premier League is coming out to its 30th anniversary. And uh, without the foreign influences from people from all around the world, it would not be what it is today. Can I just ask this question? Do you really believe that Claudio Ranieri laid the solid foundations that led Jose Mourinho to do so well. Did you enjoy him as a coach? Yeah, I, I did. I did. I, 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 I think the big turning point was Roman Abramovich. That, uh, I think that that was the massive turning point. But um, I, I'm with you in terms of, uh, you know, laying down, laying down certain foundations. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Look, and, and some managers are really good at that. 
And then, you know, then there's other managers who need to come in to be the icing on the cake. Um, but I think the biggest foundations were, were, were laid. Like I said, I think as soon as Roman Abramovich came in, it was quite clear where they, where they wanted to go and what they wanted to be. Um, but there's, there's no doubt that um, Ranieri brought a certain type of class, a certain type of dignity, and a certain type of stability as much as you're going to see at Chelsea. Uh, because, you know, since Abramovich has come in, they've had more managers than anyone. But domestically, they've won more trophies than anyone. So you can't really argue with, with the way that, uh, that he goes about things. But there's no doubt about that. Um, like I said, he's a very dignified man. Um, you know, had his own ways. And it was good because remember at that time as well, you know, around 1999, 2000, Serie A was still the, the benchmark in terms of leagues around the world. Um, so it was good to get somebody of his experience. Did you, did you use this, this famous story with the bell and Ranieri, the dilly ding, dilly dong bell? I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with it because I remember <laughs> hearing about that from players. Yeah. Um, this, like, he had his little bell that when, when people weren't working hard enough, is that, was that a thing he used with you guys? No, he, he used to say that term was I remember, but I think that was mainly because of his his English wasn't you know wasn't great. So you know, if he wanted to wake everyone up, he used to use that term, but he never had the bell. Yeah, <laughs> never had the bell. Actually, he was quite. It was funny because he was one uh. of uh, you know I remember uh, specifically playing at Derby so once. And we're, yeah, uh, playing at Derby once, and uh, we're losing one nil at half time, and 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 it wasn't going particularly well. So coming out of you know. The dressing room at Manchester United, if that was happening. So Alex would come in and by the time you come into the dressing room, he'd already be screaming at someone, yeah. Um, but but uh, Mr. Ranieri back then anyway was complete opposite. You know, people were arguing all that he just wanted complete silence for everyone to relax for about two or three minutes before he calmly put across exactly what you know what he wanted us to do. And you know, to be fair, that day anyway, it worked and we came back, it was it was one one. Um, but that was the contrasting styles. Like I said, you know, everyone's different the way they go about things. But th that was more him. But definitely at training, it was, you know, like I said, dilly dee, dilly dong, you know, but he never had the actual, the bell in his hand. But he would actually say that, you know, come on, come on, come on, you know. That's, that's wonderful. I actually love that story as well, that he would insist on some moment of quiet before the start. I, I actually, that's, I, that's sort of insight. I love, I love hearing that stuff because different managers have different ways yeah. of doing that, but it, it fits yeah. with this idea I have of him in my head. Yeah. No, no, he may have changed now, but that was definitely him back then, put it that way. The other thing I, I, I'll always remember is that three seasons at a place called Rocco Perena. I think it was about two or three hours south of Rome. He used to take us in the mountains. The, the, the population of the town, I reckon, was about 50. Um, but those pre-seasons were absolutely fantastic. You never felt, felt fitter or, or more healthier going to those pre-seasons. Sasha Pisani joins us next and asked whether Federico Chiesa should be looking to move on from Juventus. Obviously, you know, your, your work has been looking at, on the, the stat side of things, has been on the analytics side. I was wondering if there's anything sort of that's come up in the numbers about events that's really surprised you or, or that you think people haven't paid attention to that is relevant to how they're struggling at the moment. I think it's just a lot of it's their general form. Like you just look at the amount of games I've already lost this year compared to the I've already lost five games. I think they had lost only six in total mm. last season. Their, their home form, it's just un Juventus like. Um, it, you call me a bit off guard. Um, <laughs> prep yeah, I'm the, sorry, I threw that one at you without real warning. I should have asked you that. I, I think it's just you know the, the writing's on the wall. I think it's clear. They're just you know all departments they're, they're in decline. Um, you know people are calling you know uh, Allegri a dinosaur tactically. Whether he's that, I'm not sure. But um, whoever, whoever comes in is going to face the same problems, I think. Um, you look at a lot of those players. That, that, that I don't think a lot of them are good enough for, you, for, for the club. Um, and then the other problem is with their financial issues, it's not just the, you know, a matter of you know, keeping in the transfer market and fixing it with their financial problems. It's going to take a lot of time. So I think there might be a fair bit of pain um, to get back to where they want to be. On, Ki on Chiesa, though, like seriously, well, he, mu well, he must be thinking, what's he going to do at the end of the season? Is it worth him staying there? Like, mm. he, he seriously, you have to consider the direction of the club. You know, there's talk in yeah. big clubs following him. Would you, would you want to stay? That's, that's you know, that's a, a serious question. I think he has to consider it because he's shown he can perform on the biggest stage. Does he want to stick around for this, this kind of rebuild? I, 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 I'm not sure. In November, we were so excited to have Gab Marcotti come and join us on the podcast and get the band 
back together. As usual, he had some strong opinions about Juventus and strangely, we all seem to be in agreement. So, Allegri, should we sack him? <laughs> well, look, I don't know. I, I think when Allegri took the job, he looked at the situation. Again, I think Allegri understands that football's moved on, that you know, he wasn't going to be... I don't know, you've had this conversation many times, right, about the direction mm-hmm. of travel and that Juventus committed to a certain direction under Sarri and Pirlo and it didn't work out for different reasons. I think Allegri looks at it genuinely and says, I'm a smarter coach than those guys. I can play defensive football. I can play more, attack, more attacking football. I'm a better man manager. I'm more experienced. So I'm just going to get these players and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to coach my way out of it because Keza, Kulusevsky, look at that. These are good players. The Lake, um, I think he genuinely thought he could do that. And maybe he still can. And it's taking longer. And I genuinely don't know what to tell you because I see them against Zenit. And again, leaving aside the scoreline, right? And I absolutely yeah. hate it. Certain people, sorry, I mean that, especially you, the fans who, it's all about the result, Fido la fine, all this nonsense, right? All this garbage. <laughs> So, you know, when they beat Chelsea, I'm like, oh, big win over Chelsea. You're also, you know, lucky as hell. Like, you didn't deserve to win that game at all. Oh, I don't you think so? I thought they played well in that game. No, yeah, I, I just I thought it was just a lot of defending and blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know. But I saw the game against Zenny and I said, this is good. This is what you want to do. You're taking the game to the opposition. You're imposing yourself. Chiesa is unshackled. He's running rampant. Even Bernardeschi played well. I, you know, this is good. Dybala looked alive, right? And so I said, all right, how they turn the corner? Can they, can they carry this over against Fiorentina? Fiorentina, by the way, who I think have an exceptional and often overlooked coach in Italiano. And there's actually some things that worked really well. Um, I thought, you know, I didn't see Vlaovic on the pitch, presumably because the lake stuffed him in his shorts and we didn't see it. <laughs> But the lick is really good. The lick, too, by the way, has received a lot of unfair criticism. Again, from certain Juve types who believe that Bonucci and Chiellini can still get the job done consistently and that it's, you know, 2010. That said, Geza came alive far too late. The less said about the other attackers in this game, the better. Um, and I look at this and, you know, some people are like, oh, but Bernardeschi wasn't there. And so he had to... I'm sorry, if you're relying on Bernardeschi to be a difference maker, you know, you've got problems. I, 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 genuinely, I genuinely don't know. I, I hope Allegri goes away next two weeks, sits down with his staff and says, all right, why are we so Jekyll and Hyde in terms of performance and mentality and approach? Leave the results to one side. The results will come in the end. It's you, but they'll sneak up the table and then, you know, whatever. They'll be in with a shot, right? Come April, um, they'll be there, thereabouts, right? I, I'm not, you don't worry about that. But they've shown that they can actually play the way I think mm. Allegri would want him to play. Um, but then they, four days later, you know, you get this crap that we saw without a single shot on target until Milenkovic went, uh, was sent off. That's not good enough. And it's really, I think, really got, Allegri's got to wonder, why are they like this? Yeah, I, I, it's the classic Allegri narrative, isn't it, though, that, that he takes a bit of a season to work things out. And then when he works it out, that's when the shackles do come off, which is I, I totally see where you're coming from, Gab. You get that Zenit game, you think, is this the moment? I think that's what's bugging me so far is I, I don't see the innovation. Where's, where's this innovation coming? Taking the shackles off Federico Chiesa sounds great, right? That's what I want to see. I, I love watching Federico Chiesa play. I thought even in this game where events weren't great, that single-mindedness that he has, where it's just like, I'm just going to try and win this game now. <laughs> it nearly worked, right? Like he had a uh, shot off the bar. He had another one that went really close. I think it's kind of funny. You mentioned Bernadeschi there, who's another Fiorentina ex. That, but I think it's kind of funny that a lot of us were all focused on Chiesa, waiting for him to, to win the game against his former team. Then Cuadrado, who, by the way, shows up so often at the end of games. I would love to have like a <laughs> put together a file of just all the like, 85th minute onwards goals he scored because there's been quite a few. Um, but it's, it's easy to say, take the shackles off Kiesa and, and that'll, 
it'll fix things. And I've even probably said things like that. I'm not saying that to have a go at you because I think I've said things like that. But what is the system? What is the system that allows Chiesa to take the shackles off? What is the system that is going to consistently get us the best of Federico Chiesa? Because as far as I'm concerned, that should be the whole plan right now because he's the best player they've got. Well, but the problem is though, Nikki, sorry, uh, sorry, Mina, is that you have another player who's likely going to become the highest paid player at Juventus by some distance, who's also supposedly the best player at the club. He isn't. (laughs) I know who you're talking about and he's not. (laughs) I know, but yeah, I'm talking about Paolo Dybala. No, but but this is the thing. This is where, (laughs) because of the crappy way, the crappy short-sighted way that Mm -hmm. this club's been run a long time, they're now up a creek without a paddle, right? They're so terrified of losing Dybala on a free transfer. Just lose it. Honestly, I would say, whatever he's making now, you've saved yourself that money. Yes. Let yes. him go. Dare him. Hey, Paolo, you think there's a big chunk of people waiting up for you? <laughs> let's see what happens. Yeah, let's, let's see. see. No, honestly, but Mina, you're with me. You either come back on our terms or that's it. Yes. Yes. You and Milan do. Why not? You know? Let's Same thing with Milan. Go, Milan. Go, one. Better salary. Go, please. You know? <laughs> This club's been around. I don't even know if they're at the hundred year mark or if it just feels that way. But you've been around for a long time. And I know that they like to use this marketing term about winning all the time. No, they haven't won all the time. Sometimes yes. you need to go backwards to go forwards. And it's one thing if you're saying we have Cristiano Ronaldo, let's put all our let's push or put all our chips in the middle of the table because we won in the Champions League. Fine. But he's not there anymore. He's gone. You can't treat Dybala and Morata that are so important now because Ronaldo's gone. Yes. Just live with it. You've got a bazillion guys on loan around Europe. Just dare them to do something. Don't, d- d- don't succumb to Dybala. Where do you think he's going to go? <laughs> you think Conte's going to take him at Spurs? The chip sailed. Did you think he's going to United? Who's going to give you, who's going to offer Dybala, 28-year-old Dybala a big contract? Nobody. Nobody. So you work out something with him. I really hope they take a hard line with him because otherwise we're back to the same, to the same nonsense as before, that because Dybala is there, because Morata is there, oh, then there's no money, then we have to get some, to some crappy low-rent striker next year and local Chiesa has to go and check himself because he doesn't want to destabilize what Dybala might be doing somewhere on the pitch. No, no. If you have to rebuild, rebuild, rebuild with Allegri. He's shown that he can do it. But, you know, it's like, like, like the party's over. Delini's going to be gone soon. Bonucci hopefully will be gone as well. I mean, I'm saying hopefully because they're bad, but because you can't keep squeezing this stuff. Have the ball to go out there and say, Delict, Locatelli, uh, Chiesa, Kulusevsky maybe. You guys are what we're going to build around. If it takes time, it takes time. But we'll come back before. I have a thought in my head, Gab, um, about Bonucci and and Chiellini, which is a challenging thought because as an Italian, I, I loved this summer and they came together this summer in that way that, that they do and, and they were brilliant. And I almost want... You were nicely hedged in the final there, weren't you, Nikki? I, I, I had a piece explaining why I wasn't that hedged, actually, Gab, an old medium piece. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was nicely joking. hedged financially, though. Um, good betting this summer. Um, as you know, Gab, I know a thing or two about putting a good bet on the football. Um, but I, I wonder if uh, Bonucci and Chiellini's summer has almost deluded people about where we are in this story. Because Chiellini had an amazing summer, but Chiellini is, is not Chiellini of, of five years ago, probably not even two years ago at this point. And they, that transition to delict has been too slow now. And I, I think I'm with you with your, your big point here. Juventus are not going to win the league this season. I'm probably going to end up regretting this. Someone's going to wave it in my face when they somehow do, but they're still, even after this weekend, 14 <laughs> points back, they're not going to win the league this season. They'll probably make the top four, but this is the moment to start embracing long-term planning and not be focused on the short-term planning. I think that's a really good point you made there. I, I just don't understand why they're being held hostage. I also want to understand why Rogani is still in this <laughs> team. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not like he made some major error, but it hurts me that this guy that couldn't even put in a performance for Cagliari is now starting for Juventus, you know? The studio's there too. Is that sure you up? Yeah, no, but he's at least somebody that even, you know, Allegri believes in. I mean, honestly speaking, but, I mean, Rabio, like, 
who is this man? Like, honestly, what have you done? Like, what have you done to my team? You know, and Dybala, for all of his brilliance that he can produce on the pitch, and I have always maintained that, this is also a man who firstly keeps asking for more money. And on top of that is always, always injured. You can never consistently rely on him for physically to be present. You know, your best ability is your availability. Sorry, it is a cliche, but <laughs> be available. I mean, the man never is. And so for me, I, I, it's being held hostage by too many average players. You know, Arthur's always injured. I, I don't know what Rabio does, really, honestly. I mean, it's not like he's terrible. I just don't know what he produces of value, really. So, shall we troll Nikki by bringing up Aaron <laughs> Ramsey too? I was but they are working on getting rid of him. So at least on that, they're not being held oh hostage. My God. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, can we can we say can we put something slightly in Allegri's defense? I will always defend him. Yes, or in Juve's defense, I I, I feel dirty defending the club. It does mess up your plans. When yes. Cristiano Ronaldo, 48 hours from the end of the transfer window, leaves because Cristiano Ronaldo affects so many things, and I think you know we have to we have to accept that. Maybe one day somebody will talk and tell us the real story. That you know, I'm pretty sure they tried to peddle him all summer, and nobody was interested. And in the end, George Mendes had to go and knock on doors around Europe to find until he could find somebody who could afford him, and Cristiano wanted to go to. But it does completely, completely mess you up at that stage when you've done your whole preseason yeah. thinking Cristiano is going to be a part of it. Um, and to Allegri, more than other managers, that whole work that they do in the preseason is really, really important. More recently, we had the talented Gianluca Buzio of Venezia and the US men's national team come on the show. We'd asked him why he chose when quite a few European clubs were knocking to come to Venezia. Um, I think for me, it was always uh, going to be Italy. I think uh, with my, my, my dad being Italian and, you know, I just grew up watching the Serie A and, you know, the, the more I played in the MLS, the, the more and more interest was coming from Italy. So it was kind of just uh, all written and, uh, you know, perfect for me. So I, I felt that this was the right spot for me and, you know, for Venezia and, and for me to come here is, uh, you know, I talked to, to some other clubs in the, the Serie A and, you know, when I talked to Venice, I always, I had the, the feeling of a, a family pretty much, you know, I, even through calls, you could tell that they were a, you know, a tight knit group and everything was run more of a, a family aspect and they were, uh, you know, really just focused and they seemed uh, uh, very interested in me as a, as a person and a player. So for me, I, I felt most comfortable when I was, you know, talking to them. And I think that's what, uh, when I first moved to Kansas, that's what I was looking for. So I kind of was looking for the same things and Venice offered that the, the best. Al minuto numero 47 della ripresa il pareggio del Venezia, la conclusione di Busio deviata da un difensore del Cagliari, la palla va a spiazzare Cragno, la beffa per il Cagliari, la esultanza da parte del Venezia. Che Do you maniera... feel that in Italy, you know, playing and in that role, and so, you know, like you said, no, nobody really wants to defend, but they, are you forced into that a lot more? Obviously, um, is that something that you feel like, you know, defense is so important to Italians where you didn't feel like necessarily that you, you had more freedom elsewhere? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, uh, especially in our team, obviously we're not, you know, the, the Milans or Napoli's where we can, you know, go out and, you know, cruise through games sometimes. So we have to, the main part of our, our, you know, team is to defend. I think, uh, if you don't have that side of it, then you can't attack really. I think the attack starts with the defense. So you need players who, uh, you know, are, are going to want to defend, even if they're not great at it. It's about, you know, the mentality of it. And, and I think that's what I'm learning now. It's not that you're a good 1v1 defender. If you're strong, if you're fast, it's, you know, if you want to want to win the ball, if you want to defend, then, you know, you could do it. So especially with uh, Zanetti as our coach now, he's, uh, he's very, very big on that. He can say all the tactics in the world and come up with master plans. But if, you know, there's not 11 guys on the field who would, you know, put their body on the line to stop a goal, then, you know, you're not going to play. And uh, that's something that he's been very, very hard about. And 
you know, you know, on the, the other side, on the offensive side, it's more about, you know, creativity and, and be free. But, you know, everybody has to defend first to get there. I, I'm curious because actually um, Beach for me is a spot in Kansas City is also very much like a, a everyone has to team effort defend kind of manager, right? Like he's not someone who is going to let you off with that sort of being an attacker and, and not, not chipping in. I don't think that's something that you see in his style either. But of course, we hear a lot, yeah. even within Europe, we hear a lot from English players or, or players from other countries who go to Italy that they can be surprised by how tactical the game is, by how much the focus is on specifics of tactics. Was that a, a shock at all for you coming to Italy? Is Zanetti like that? Or did you find it more similar than you were expecting? Um, no, it's definitely what everybody says about it. It's a very tactical. I think every game we have, we have a, a different game plan. Every, you know, every other game we'll have something new to try to exploit the them and and you know how we're going to defend them and uh I, I like it a lot i think i'm I'm learning so much about the game from from each game i'm just learning a lot uh you know different ways to you know break down teams different ways to defend and it's something that you know i didn't really know much about and obviously i watch a lot a lot of games and you know in my free time i watch premier league the other set of AI games so i'm learning a lot but you know, the, the best way to learn for me is, you know, really being out there and, and, and doing it. So uh, it uh, it surprised me a little bit, but it wasn't, you know, anything I didn't expect. I knew that this was the the one of the biggest, you know, sides of it was the, the tactics and everything. And as a player, I think if you have that, you know, you learn that side of the game, the tactics and the you know, defensive side of it, it can only help you as a player. I don't think anyone could disagree that one of the standout talents in Serie A in 2021 was Fiorentina's Dusan Blavic, who scored 33 goals in his calendar year, equaling the record set by Cristiano Ronaldo. We've loved talking about him. But I think that my biggest takeaway from this is Blavic is really, really the, the real deal. Like he is just, he's just on another level. Attacca il lungo, Vlaovic che mette giù il pallone, Vlaovic ha girato Tataruscia, Vlaovic! Contro il suo mito, Vlaovic 3-0 Fiorentina! Contro Ibrahimovic, spunta Vlaovic e segna il suo primo gol in carriera ai rossoneri. Sa molto di sentenza. Con un movimento perfetto ad attaccare la linea. I would honestly like drive my entire forward line from Juventus over to Fiorentina <laughs> and pay the money just to take this kid home with me. God, isn't that an interesting idea? What if um, it's pretty hard, harder to pull off now because the contract is already so short? But what if Juventus could talk Fiorentina into taking Dybala for Vlavic? I know you'd take that deal in a heartbeat. <sighs> I mean, I would give them money on top of it. <laughs> It's like it's not even part of the exchange. It's just an extra, like, it's like when you buy a new fridge and you pay an extra £10 to take away your old fridge. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Dibala, it's your oh, old wow. discarded fridge. That's what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to put what you're saying to me, Mina, into, into concrete terms. Is that what you're saying? Into terrible terms. <laughs> now he's an old fridge that I got to get rid of. <laughs> You can tell I just moved house, can't you? You can tell I just moved house because these are the things I'm thinking of. No, basically, I'm giving them money because they're going to need a lot of it because of his injuries, you know? Like, the poor guy, I mean, it must be really horrible for him. But another injury, I just give me Vlaovic, you know? <laughs> I, is, Vlaovic is really, really all right. He's special. I mean, he scored 10 goals already this season in 13 games. That puts him joint top with Chile Mobile in the scoring charts. Um, he scored 27 goals in this calendar year, which is um, now level with Kurt Hamrin as Fiorentina's best ever calendar year for a player. Um, he's 21 years old. He doesn't look 21, does he? When you look at him, you're like, that's, a, no. that's an adult man, which not all 21-year-olds look like. No, no, you're absolutely right. Although Donnarumma never looked like he was a kid. Well, that's either. true. Yeah. <laughs> he's good. But I mean, I, I do, I did enjoy his little interview in which he said, you know, Vincenzo Italiano is just always very angry. And when he's angry, he calls me Dusan. <laughs> and I'm just thinking in my head like that, you must be called Dusan a lot. Because <laughs> that man is always angry. But I, I do love the relationship they seem to have as well. And I feel like they're extracting the best out of Lavage with Italiano at the helm. Um, and I, 
although I honestly speaking with the way that he plays and the way that he trains, I think that he'll be a success wherever he goes. He's one of the most like reliable, like as in if I'm putting money on something, I trust him and I trust Osman. Yeah, I, I think there was an interesting um, sort of uh, just contrast that came into my head actually um, during this game because of Ricky Sapanara. And I'm not suggesting that Sapanara was ever the talent that, that Blavic is, but Sapanara technically is is a, a reasonably rare footballer. He can do Fantastic. things that a lot of footballers can't do. And then you listen to Italiano at the end of the game and Italiano says, Ricky's interesting because you have to like basically find the way to push his buttons. You have to find the things that stimulate him and you have to keep doing it. Like you have to always keep finding those ways to do it. Beyond him. Whereas Vlahovic, I just think is absolutely in his own head, hell bent on becoming special. Like he wants to go and be an elite footballer playing for one of the best clubs in Europe. It's why he won't sign a new contract because he's determined to go on and, and, and become really big and you need both right like you have to have talent you can't just be anyone and do that and become one of the best but he he has got that second thing that you need of being really intensely driven i think and i think it it matters quite a lot if you're going to take that last step you love it to be mentioned in the same bracket as han and like if he was at RC dortmund would you not imagine him scoring just as many goals as, as potentially obviously han has proved himself now in every way in the champions league as well so that is something that we haven't yet tested Vlaovic. but i mean seeing the way that he trains seeing how everyone talks about him from his coach to the everyone around him really you know his teammates um ibrahimovic even this kid is very, very, very special. Is there a potential that, you know, we're, we're all so concerned with what's happening with Mbappe in Haaland, but could this guy be the third guy that joins them in that pantheon of the gods, you know? I, I think in, in that age group, so I put Mbappe in, I guess, a different pocket in my brain because he's he's a wide forward, or at least he's plays there mostly at the moment, whereas um, Haaland is, is another number nine, right? So Haaland and Vlaovic, you can draw like quite a compare. Uh, direct sort of comparison between. And I think you've nailed it. I mean, like Vlaovic, the only thing he's missing for me to put him alongside Haaland is that Haaland has played those Champions League games. So I'm excited to see when Vlaovic gets that chance, how he does. But I think domestically, what he's done is is already extraordinary. And probably there's two things that have stopped him from being acknowledged on that level, which is the biggest one is the Champions League and not playing in it. And the second one is even just I guess a, a step before that, he plays for a club who haven't even played in Europe the last five years. In Germany, Dortmund are yeah. pretty much the number two, every, well, not every year, but certainly in terms of status, they're number two to Bayern Munich. I think if Harlan, if Blavich was already playing at even a Napoli outside the Champions League, there might be more attention on him than there is at Fiorentina, who aren't just a, a club in their recent history who have that sort of international attention. Yeah, so that's why if you are somebody who wants to criticize him for not signing a contract, you have to understand that for his own career and his own ambitions and to be recognized as somebody who really works day in and day out, he needs to play for a club that's going to be challenging on every on every level. And if the senior at 30 is asking for demands of what Napoli can provide him with in terms of ambition, then surely Blaubich is allowed to do the same because you know what? He doesn't disappear from matches. Let's move on <laughs> to <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I do take a lot of things that it's <laughs> It's just a funny thing. I don't actually mean it. I think he's fabulous. I maybe mean it a little bit. Seria Chronicles is excited to partner with Kalido Media, an Australian digital media agency specializing in website design and development and digital marketing. The Kalido Media team has a diverse range of digital skills, including helping our podcast by managing its social media accounts and editing videos for YouTube. Whether you're looking to enhance your website to attract new business or find an audience via social media marketing to generate leads and sales, Kalido Media will work with you to develop a customized digital strategy for your business. They've had a lot of success in generating leads and driving online traffic for various types of businesses, including home builders, renovators, and kitchen cabinetry professionals, commercial cleaning, and even tennis coaches. So if you're looking to attract new eyeballs to your business to generate leads and drive sales, 
visit kellydomedia.com.au to get in touch with the team to discuss a strategy to fire up your business, connect with your ideal audience and communicate your message. Fire up, connect and communicate with Kellydo Media. See the link in the show notes. We also got to talk about Italy, not always enjoying it, but sometimes we talked about them after winning the Euros this year and reigniting the passions of the national team. We talked about how they'd given us a heart attack by not qualifying directly for the World Cup and they will now have to go through the playoffs to get to Qatar. Here was how we reacted right after that most frustrating final qualifying group match against Northern Ireland. È chiusa, è finita e in questo momento l'Italia non arriva direttamente a Qatar 2022, bisognerà ancora aspettare, aspettare il mese di marzo e finisce con tristezza con i giocatori azzurri che escono dal campo a testa bassa, è finita 0 a 0, la Svizzera va direttamente ai mondiali, noi quella, quella qualificazione dovremo ancora faticosamente conquistarla. It's just so dismal, Mina, it's, it's so dismal and I think for me, like, there's there's a need to separate out what's happened, right? So it's one thing to finish behind Switzerland, who are not uh, uh, some joke team. Switzerland, not France out of the Euros, the actual Euros, uh, not qualifying, the actual Euros not many months ago, who took Spain to penalty at those same Euros. They're a serious team. It's one thing to not be able to score in a one-off game away to Northern Ireland, who haven't conceded a goal at home all through qualifying. I can compartmentalize those two things. What I can't compartmentalize is that Italy have not won seven of their last nine games they failed to win in 90 minutes. They've only won two of their last nine matches inside 90 minutes. And that to me is big, big, big problems for a team that now has to go and win uh, two playoff games to get to World Cup. Yeah, I think that's the issue. I think that we can talk about the fact that this was a horrible game, but to be honest, coming into a final like this match with so much pressure riding on it and asking them to score two goals against Northern Ireland, who, like you said, haven't conceded throughout qualifiers. When you know Switzerland are at home and playing Bulgaria, another team Italy should have defeated when they played them at home. Because yeah. let's be honest, they are just not a very good team, you know? I, I know, like, we can look at this Northern Ireland one, but it was a mishmash. Like, you know, this it was, you know, Italy dominating it, what, 66% percentage. In the first half, overall, like over 70% of the game. So many more completed passes. Really few good chances, though. Really few good yeah. chances. Yeah. Northern, Northern Ireland probably had the best two. <laughs> yeah. And, mm. but, you know, these, this doesn't matter. And or, or this game, it shouldn't have been decided in this game. I had a lot of question marks on the way I think that Switzerland was handled, um, at least like the choices that were made. And how that, that match was started and the decision to play Belotti and Chiesa up front when I think that Arzi should have started. I, I have like lots of things that I really disliked about the way that that game was handled. And of course, the discussion is Jorginho and penalties, but more for me, Jorginho's performances in general recently, you know, there's a lot of players that I think that. I would have loved to have Lorenzo Pellegrini. I really feel like, you know, in these types of matches, his creativity, his way of playing the game would have just made a, a little bit of a difference. I, the fullback situation is a disaster for me because I know Di Lorenzo scored the goal against Switzerland, but my God, had you seen a, a fullback under more pressure in the, in the early, especially in the early stages against Switzerland, I thought I, it was a horror show for me, you know? So. Mm. You know, you look at the squad and you think, God, they won the Euros, you know, but sometimes you look at them and you can see like there's just not a centre forward that can score a goal. You know, they have here, they haven't. We've scored our goals through pretty much anyone else but a centre forward, you know, and I'm not counting Lithuania. I don't know what the, what that was, you know, but there are just so it was Lithuania. Many... <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but it is, it is like I am, I'm worried a little bit about Look, I know this is going to sound crazy because we won, we won against England, but I hated the way Mancini handled that match. And, 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 and I hated the fact that it had to rely on substitutions and basically Southgate's in, inability to affect through substitutions that won it for Italy through penalties in the end. 
But there are question marks that I have. And the way that they started that match when they were under pressure from the likes of Luke Shaw is exactly the way they started the match against another physically fit, good, dynamic, vertical team in Switzerland. It's like, are you not learning your mistakes here? This is what's bothering me. People love to talk about, oh, how can you uh, still rely on Giorgio Chiellini and Leonardo Bonucci? Who do you want me to rely on exactly? Bastoni's in Giorgio <laughs> Rugani? Who, 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 who is there? Romagnoli? You know? If you have a great centre back that's being ignored, then bring him up because right now I can't really, I don't know which centre back that you think that should be playing ahead right now of those two. And Kalini's not playing. I know Echerbi's not great, but Bastoni's not available. So who do you want? Unless you can provide me with a centre back that's worth it. This is a stupid argument that people continue to have. Youth is not going to always win you World Cup. Sometimes it's nice to have a mix. And all of a sudden, I don't know why that's become the talking point. The talking point that we have to discuss is A, should Jorginho win the World Cup? B, should he be taking penalties, win the World Cup, or win the Ballon d'Or? <laughs> yeah. Should he be taking penalties? I'd love him to win the World Cup. Let's all win the yeah. World Cup. <laughs> and Mancini, again, why are you always starting with two finalizers? You need two ball players and one final. Keza cannot play alongside the center board. You have to know that from having played against England. You knew your changes made the difference. It's Berardi, Insignia and Keza. Or it's Immobile, Berardi and Insignia. But it's not Keza and Berardi, our be- uh, sorry, uh, and uh, Belotti or Immobile. You have to have two ball players up front alongside a dynamic point. Anyway, that's, that's my rant over. You go for it now. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like I, I have to hold my own hands up on the Jorginho thing. I was all aboard the Jorginho Ballon d'Or um, <laughs> conversation, but in the last two months, it's been all Jorginho ballooning the ball, unfortunately, not um, anything to cheer about. I mean, this is, this is, Three penalties in a row now he's missed. Um, I mm. think there should have been real questions asked about whether he should be still taking penalties against anyone after he missed against Switzerland, having already missed in the shootout final against England, but especially against Jan Sommer. Because if you go back and watch the first, so the first time Italy played Switzerland in the group and Jorginho misses a penalty that stops Italy from winning the game and Sommer saves it. And that was when Jorginho was still doing his little hop and Sommer's brilliant on it. Sommer body fakes one way and he's obviously selling to Jorginho, I'm going this way, so you do your hop and then I'll go the other way and it works. And I just can't believe that that wasn't in Jorginho's head as he steps up and skies this penalty. So there's no way he should have been taking that penalty. And I say that with so much love for him, so much sort of wanting him to be celebrated for what he did in the Euros. And there's this part of me that is like, Oh, the news cycle is so fast, Mina. It's punishing. I mean, all these things you're sort of saying about um, the attack, about the problems, I'm there going, yes, yes. And I'm going, in my notes here, I've got written down from Gazetta this week. So before the Northern Ireland game, Italy mm. scored 102 goals in 45 games under Mancini. The average goals per game is second only to Pozzo's team So uh, for Italy. So this is a historically brilliant attacking Italy team suddenly can't score goals. It's not like they've always been like this. And Jorginho has had a brilliant year. It's just that the last little bit for Italy has been awful and probably will cost him a Ballon d'Or. You think so? The thing that, the question that I've actually been, the question that I've been struggling with in the last sort of half an hour is if you had told me before the start of the Euros, you're going to win the Euros, you get to enjoy Italy winning the Euros. But the trade-off for that is you don't qualify for a World Cup. Would I have taken it? And I, I, I'm really struggling with this because honestly, it's such an evil question, right? Because look, here's the truth. I think at the end of life, when you sort of look back on all your footballing memories, you remember the highs and there's nothing that's as high as winning these tournaments, right? So the tournaments are the things you remember. But in the moment, missing out on the World Cup four years ago was awful. The whole world is having a party when the World Cup is on and you're not invited. And it's awful. Mm. It's a horrible, horrible feeling to have that happen. And our producer, Simon, actually pointed something out that I hadn't really put together in my head before um, we started, which is the last knockout game that Italy played at a World Cup was a 2006 World Cup final. That's crazy. 
like, oh my God, I didn't even think about that. You're right. It's crazy. And it's like all of these, you know, again, the World Cup is, is the best of the best. I bloody love the World Cup. It's just football at its most sort of... I wouldn't worry too bad. It's going to be every two years. There were plenty of opportunities going ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, can you imagine if Italy fail to qualify, they're going to get all aboard that wagon, aren't they? You're going to see all of the Italian football big wigs suddenly throwing themselves into. Maybe maybe that could be Agnelli's thing, new thing. Maybe now that Agnelli's Super League hasn't worked out. I think really the undeniable highlight of this year was that we all got introduced to Mina's poetic prowess when she started to give us her very own limericks in a tribute to you guys, the Chronicles Tifosi. Now, Mina, right back in the long, long ago, or at least eight weeks now, when we started this podcast, when we were first uh, saying hello to our, our new supporters who were being very generous and making donations, and we were reading out some of their lovely mail and messages they'd written to us. You made a promise. I'm pretty sure, as we discussed on the podcast, it was a legally binding promise, a contractual oh, promise, no. a guarantee to produce a limerick celebrating some of the messages we'd got. And all this time later, it still hasn't happened. Mina, uh -huh. I thought you, you have a promise. limerick for me? Look, I was kind of hoping that, you know, like we are getting older and that you might forget. <laughs> and, uh, you I know. do forget a lot. <laughs> and I wouldn't be called out on this. Um, but uh, yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. You know, I, I guys, I promised you guys something and secretly I wanted to be a rap star when I was younger. And I think that's why I got tired <gasps> over the idea. Um, <laughs> I was never going to be a rap star. It's never too late, Mina. I mean, it might be too late, but it's never too <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I I would never. I would never. Uh -huh, I would never. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we actually had like a a, a comment because it was sometimes I don't know which ones that I just think I can work into a limerick, but um, we got one from Calcio Crawl on September the twenty first, and uh, he said, "Firstly, delighted you have been able." Actually, I don't know if it's a he or she. I just said he, but Calcio Crawl, do tell us. Firstly, delighted you've been able to pull this together. Only just got to the first episode, which was excellent. Delighted you both played nice. I'm sure that won't always be the case. Have a great season. Yeah. So this is the one that ended up, um, well, let's just say uh, getting me to write this one. You both played nice. Won't always be the case, wrote Calcho Crawl. Oh no, the ladies wondered. Have they stumbled upon a troll? Beseeched with anxiety, Mina yearned for Nikki's dulcet tones to calm her nerves and rid her of the nerves brought on by hormones. Nikki assured <laughs> how to. <laughs> this is way too much. I'm dying. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Nikki assured how to crawl was no troll. He was delighted and his words made them whole. <laughs> It was, was worth, it the, worth wait. the wait. Did I? Did I miss well, you? <laughs> I think our producer's like, "What? Well, that's lost." I think so. I think producer Simon thinks we've actually fully lost, lost the plot. Um, I personally um, uh, think that this is a great start. Um, I'm looking forward to you building on it as you build your new career in rap and limerick <laughs> uh, writing. Yes, they will be centered around my hormones <laughs> and the anxiety that I suffer. Of course, there were loads more highlights than just these, but here were a few. Uh, I hope you enjoyed them. We've loved doing the Chronicles Q&A episodes at the end of each week. They've been really popular with you guys, which we've loved as well. And we've loved having your questions come in every week and lead us to no end of interesting discussion between myself and Mina. Please do 
keep those coming in 2022. That's all from us for now. Thank you to everyone who has listened to Celiac Chronicles in 2021, everyone who's subscribed to the show, everyone who's followed us across our social media platforms, support us with a donation, written reviews, and sent us questions for the Q&A episodes. In the meantime, we hope you've had a great Christmas. Wishing you all the best for this new year. We're going to be back really soon at the start of next week with all of the latest from Serie A, all of the latest analysis and discussion, as well as some exciting developments to come for the podcast. So please do keep your eye on those podcast feeds. everyone we're going to do what we always do and talk about the top three matches for 40 minutes and rush everything else because <laughs> <laughs> yeah because because there's loads to say about the top few teams we're not going to have an in-depth conversation about empathy sports social podcast network for the ones who get it done the most important part is the one you need now and the best partner is the one who can deliver that's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, because we have professional grade supplies for every industry, even hard to find products. And we have same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.